we're going to go ahead and get started with the talk. This is about shade gardening, shade perennials. I am, this is not going to be like all the shade perennials that I would love to talk about. I'm going to go in depth with a couple of them and then hit on a few other ones that I like. I, I'm trying not to duplicate plants, talking about the same plants over and over. There's probably a couple of duplicates in here because I can't remember what I've talked about. So, yeah, so you'll have to forgive me if, if you see a couple that, you, that you've seen already. Just titled Terrestrial Orchids and Sacred Lilies, a couple of my favorites, but I, I do love shade gardening. I have always had a shade garden. Every, every house that I've had has been mostly shade. I actually bought my most recent house. I, I was really excited because I had a, a, I had sun. I'd never had sun before. Of course, I started planting out in the sun and realized that many of the plants that I really love are, I need shade. So I've started going into my woodland to, to plant those shade plants because I, I really do I get that's those are the plants that get me excited and I always do tell people that green is a color too. You know it's that color and texture and form are, are part of what makes a shade garden so wonderful but I am going to talk a lot about flowers and the first are those those terrestrial orchids. Certainly the one that we most often see is is the Japanese ground orchid, Latilla striata. It's called striata because it's got the kind of the stripes down the leaves. It's, it's striated. That's in part also the, the flower has some. You can see kind of the stripes inside there. And the, the species usually ranges from, you know, kind of a, a really pretty lurid magenta to pink. If you grow them from seed, they can they can uh, kind of uh, have different different colors, but they're super easy to grow. Just don't buy them, you know, dry in a bag at a big box store or something like that. Sometimes you see that, and those are just terrible. But they're they're about the easiest one of the easiest shade plants you can you can grow. And deer generally don't eat orchids, so I'm usually in pretty good shape. There's the white form, and there are some pink ones and lavender ones, and all kinds of of different different ones, and and hybrids out there now, like this uh, sweet lips, which has, which is a paler pink, and then it's got that really nice contrasting yellow from one of the other parents, in there. The one let me go back a little bit. The one problem sometimes people have is the foliage comes up pretty early. This must have been a really warm spring. Often you'll see instead of these pointy tips on the, the leaves, it'll be, it'll look kind of ragged on the edge, like somebody cut it with pinking shears. And that's because the, the leaves will come up and then they'll get they'll get hit by a frost and, and die back. But but really that's that's about the extent of the, the issue that, that I've usually had with them. In recent years, it used to be you could only get Latilla striata and you know a couple of cultivars there's a bunch more cultivars now and there's some other species that are coming in like this latilla ochracea which has kind of cream to yellow flowers and you can see where that sweet lips got that yellow from this parent the one that was that was first introduced chinese butterfly is a good yellow one it's it's a it's a good grower and easy to do, pretty similar to Blatilla striata, maybe a little bit taller. And one that I'm really liking now is, I believe actually a seed strain called Summer Moonshine. I went out between raindrops yesterday and took this picture in my garden, and it's it's a really really good one. These, the blatillas will bulk up. So, you know, you buy it and you've got one, you know, one stalk coming out of the ground, maybe a couple of flowers on it. You know, next year you'll have a couple more. By the third and fourth year, you'll really start having 
nice clumps of it. And they will, over time, you can get really nice big patches of it, which are, you know, beautiful when they're in flower. And, and the foliage kind of looks like, like palm seedlings when palms come up, but when it's just the new growth on a, a, a brand new palm that's coming up, it's, it's got a neat texture. It looks good in a, in a shade garden with ferns and hosta and things like that. A while back, we first saw this in Japan. I first saw it in 2006, this ogon, which just means gold. And what I love about this plant is that it has got that really lurid magenta flower color that's against that chartreuse gold foliage. And the, the flower color, I mean, the leaf color holds up pretty well. It'll kind of green up over time, but if you get it in a bright spot, It'll, it'll look good. And, and this was just one, one or two stems maybe three years ago. And you can see it's, it's you know, a nice little clump of 18 or inches across or so. So really happy if you put it in some good soil. The other ones for, for foliage, the, one of the old ones you could get, you know, with the green leaf, it had a thin white margin called albostriata just a real thin white margin around the edge, which was nice, but often you couldn't even see the white, it was so thin. But now there are some streaked ones. There's a white streaked one that I've seen. And then this one that also saw back in 2006 that was brought in, I don't know when it came in, but called Gotemba Stripes. Gotemba is a nursery that's right, kind of right near Mount Fuji in, in Japan. I've been to Gotemba several times and I'm always told if I'm lucky, I'll get a really good view of Mount Fuji. I'm still waiting though. But this has that, that magenta flower. And here you can see this came up early and got zapped by the frost. You can see how the tops are kind of chewed up. When it's really bad like this one, if I have a small patch and kind of a high profile spot, I will, I'll just snip off the tops so it's it's at least a clean edge across there rather than than it looks like it's been chewed up that's that's about the extent of the the issues i've ever had with with platillas now moving on to a different type of orchid a cymbidium now you may be familiar with the the tropical and subtropical cymbidiums that are you know, really brightly colored epiphytes. Cymbidium goringii is a little terrestrial fern. It's, this is it growing in a pot. In Japan, they love growing these in containers, but they do well in the ground. I've grown it for years and years and years. It's got kind of mixed clumps of strappy foliage, you know, think liriope, ophiopogon, that type of thing. A little grassy type leaves. And in the spring, you get the flowers. And you can see in here the little pale green flowers. And the best forms, you get some pink in there as well. But they're green flowers. I love it. It's a sweet little plant. It's a sweet little flower. But let me tell you, uh, my wife, who's not a, a plant person, she would walk by this plant a million times and never notice that there were flowers on there at all because it's not they're not very showy, but I, I think they're, I like looking closely at my plants. I like, you know, getting in there really looking at them. So I appreciate things that you have to slow down and pay attention to. There is another species, well, there's quite a few more species, but another species that's fairly hardy, maybe not quite as hardy as Goringii and maybe a little bit marginal here, but in a protected spot, you know, a little bit extra mulch in the winter is Cymbidium sinensi that has a, more of a pink flower. Same strappy foliage, but the flower's a little bit showy. Still kind of sits down amongst the, the leaves though, so won't stop you in your tracks still. I've got one little one growing in inside here in my office at, at the Arboretum that 
hoping will bulk up and get a little bit bigger so I can share it back with the Arboretum because we used to grow it in the Lath House and, and lost it a while back. Now we'll get to where it gets really showy. The Calanthes. This is another group of the, the hardy forms of just easy, easy woodland plants with really, really nice foliage. I love the foliage even after the flowers. Now, these are just a group of hybrids. The ones with the yellow flowers obviously have a lot of Calanthes sibolii, one of the species in it, that has a gorgeous yellow flower. Unlike the other ones we're talking about, these have a much wider leaf, make more of a rosette of, of foliage. But still, all, all the orchids, the veins run parallel to each other up, up the leaves. So you get kind of that same effect. More hybrids. These are, the, I think this is, I think this one with the kind of lighter flower is a hybrid between a cultivar called Satsuma and one called Kozu Red. I'm not sure about this other one, but, and maybe they're all seedlings from that cross. I'm not sure, but you can see that foliage. And as it gets older, that foliage gets taller. It'll grow to about a foot and just make a nice little, little rosette. Here's some out in the garden. This is Calanthe discolor, another species. And you can see discolor means two colors. So you have the brown on there and then the pure white, which again, the brown kind of camouflages it, but the white makes it very bright again. And as I was putting this talk together, I was realizing I don't have any Calanthe in my garden right now, and I really need to do something about that because they are, uh, they're favorites of mine and we need more. You know, we don't, other than the Blatillas, we don't grow a ton of orchids here at the Arboretum. And that's really because orchids have a tendency to walk away. They're kind of pricey to buy from nurseries and for whatever reason, more than just about any other plant, orchids tend to make people behave in ways they wouldn't otherwise. So we don't get to display as many, nearly as many as I would like out here at the Arboretum just because of unscrupulous people. Now, if you have enough money, and it takes a lot, you can get this wonderful Calanthe. Who cares what the flowers look like, although they look like this, but the foliage, look at that, snow crest, isn't that amazing? I should say that is not my plant because I don't have enough money to, to buy it. I'm hoping that over time, it'll, the price will come, come down on it, but it's pretty pricey, but beautiful. I just, I just love that. And there are other species, terrestrial orchids that are, if not hardy, at least marginally hardy. And I, maybe I should have saved some of these for next week's talk. Next week, I'm going to be talking about plants that are almost hardy here in central North Carolina. And I realized I put a few of them in this talk. But this one is one called Argentio striata. That's, that's, it's a species. And you can see it's a green leaf. And there's these silver, argent, silver streaks through the leaf. It's almost, on a picture, it's almost hard to tell if that's just the way the leaf kind of bends and folds that you're, you're getting the, that silvery streaking in there. But it is actually a kind of a pale streaking in there. It's, it's not so easy to come by, but it is, I have grown it outside before and it is, it is, it's got some hardiness to it. Let's just, I will leave it at that. But it's worth finding a protected spot. What I would do with it when it was getting going to get very cold 
I'd take some, some pine branches or something like that and just throw it on top of it. And the reason I like doing that more than just piling leaves is it keeps air in there, which is a good insulator, also keeps it from, from uh, you know, rotting out or anything. Ooh, the, the slipper orchids. This is our, our Eastern native yellow slipper orchid, Cypripedium parviflorum. We have several native Cypripedium, several native hardy terrestrial orchids that You know, you can find, you can see if you're out hiking, we have their native right here locally. If you go to Garden Treasures in Zebulon, Pat McCracken's nursery, if you go in the spring, if you pay close attention as you're driving into the nursery, he's got a long driveway. If you look to the right as you're driving, or maybe have somebody else drive and you can look to the right, if you hit it at the right time, he has got a big patch of the pink Cypripedium acaulei in the woods over there. And you can, you can get out and go look at them and take pictures. Don't ever, ever, ever try and dig up uh, Cypripediums from the wild, especially the pink one. You will kill it. It will die. You will not get it home. They're very, very difficult to remove from the wild. So just enjoy them where they are don't, don't try and dig them. I love, not all of them do this, but I love the parviflorums and the ones that do this where the, I don't, I don't, I don't know my orchid structure well enough. I don't know what they call, I know all these different parts have a different, have a different name. That's the pouch, but the, these petals that twist like this, I love that. I just think that's so wild that a flower does that. I, I don't understand what the reasoning is. I and mean, typically everything you see should have some you know, evolutionary benefit to the plant or at least not have a, not be negative. It would seem that something like this, I just, I, I don't understand what the, what the, what the evolutionary benefit would be. Just, just one of those wild things. Maybe it's something that the plant world was trying out and it didn't hurt the plant, but didn't help it. So it just kind of hung around. I don't know, but it's, it's neat. There are a lot of species of cypripediums. Not all of them grow well for us here in the Southeast. Some do better than others. Cypripedium reginae, is growable, but it is tif difficult. A good, a, somebody who does a, a good job selling orchids, especially cypripediums, will tell you, you know, this is not for the beginner. You know, this is not for a, a novice gardener. You, you really have to cite it. You have to care for it. The ones that are easy are very easy. Even these, these slipper orchids, the ones that are difficult are, can be pretty darn trip difficult. So, and they're expensive. So <laughs> there's a lot of hybrids that are coming out, some between species. And it's funny, some of the species that don't grow well for us, when they hybridize them, they all of a sudden begin growing pretty well. And Cranthos by Fasciolatum is an okay grower, not the easiest one to grow, but okay. This one I love, this name one, just ivory with that white pouch and the brownish, burgundyish, um, streaked yellow petals. That one, this one's uh, pretty, this is another one that is pretty darn tricky to grow. I think, I haven't looked at the parentage, but it looks like the West Coast one, the West Coast form, what, Cypripedium californicum maybe? I can't remember. But they have this, that has these white pouches and you can see how it'll have, there's a flower and then coming up behind it's another flower. I didn't put a picture of Cypripedium californicum. Somebody, somebody correct me in the chat if I'm giving the wrong species name. Is one that 
has, it'll have just, a, you know, a flower, a flower, a flower, a flower, a flower, a flower, all down a stem, and it can be quite tall. And if you see it in, in flower, it is, it's something you'll never forget. Now, the ones that I mostly grow at m personally, because from what, from in my experience, they are in recent years have been the easiest things to grow. There's a, a whole group of them that have mostly German names. They're from Mark Frosch, who is an orchid breeder. He breeds all these hybrid orchids. So you have Cypripedium philip. Oh, look at that, isn't that striking? Dietrich, I like Dietrich quite a bit. You can see the, the Parvaflorum influence in there, the yellowish with those twisted petals. Inga, this is, this is one of my absolute favorites. This is a picture from my garden this spring that I, I really, I really, really love this plant. But there are a lot of them. And like I said, they're expensive. I made the mistake of having bought a few of these and a few other plants and showing my wife what $300 worth of plants looks like, which was about eight plants total. <laughs> and, uh, she started paying more attention to what was going into the garden uh, after I did that, but uh, yeah, she appreciated it when she saw it flowering, I think. So, um, you know, they can be pricey, but, but these, these Froche hybrids are, have been very easy for me. I put them in a you know, bright shady spot, you know, something with morning sun or really high filtered shade. I do them in a well-drained fairly organic soil, pretty rich, but well-drained soil. And they just, you know, I, I am bedding. So it ha I had two st flowering stems this year. I'm betting I'll have uh, six or eight next year. Well, while I'm stopped there, you know, that's, I was just about to move on to some different plants. Are there any questions about orchids that were in the chat or otherwise that I can answer now? The most recent question I think is a good one is, do they make seeds that can be planted? So there are some, some real difficulties with, with seed. Generally, like when I collect orchid seed in the wild, we send it to somebody who grows them out almost like you would tissue culture. The blatillas will make seed and seed around in the garden. They're very easy from seed. You can take the seed off of blatilla and sow it like other seed. Other orchids make seed uh, if they get pollinated. A lot of the orchids have very sp specific special pollinators. A platilla apparently do not. I never get seed pods on my cypripediums. And I don't on my calanthe. I, I don't allow my calanthe to go to seed usually in the past. I usually just cut those off. But I have never seen them seeding in the garden at all. You would you would have to, I think you would have to get a, if you wanted to collect seed from an orchid and grow it at home, you'd probably need to get a, a really fine sterile seed starting mix, do it under a dome with high humidity, uh, that type of thing. All right, go back to the screen share. The next group are the, the rhodias, the sacred lilies as they're, they're known in Japan. And, and they are in the lily family writ large, depending on how you classify it. And rhodias are just great evergreen plants for shade. They are tough as nails, leathery, thick leathery, evergreen leaves small, mostly inconspicuous flowers, followed by these bright red fruits. 
this will seed around gently around where it is and will spread over time and the rosettes will get bigger and bigger and and you can divide it and move it around but it doesn't happen fast it's it's something that you gotta it takes them a little while to to really get going and, and start doing that but but they're great and they're they're pretty darn deer resistant as well that leaves those leaves are just so thick and leathery and the species is just plain green you can sow those seeds i actually just take the seeds and kind of scatter them around in the garden and don't even bother cleaning them sowing them anything and I find that they'll they'll pop up if you don't clean the the flesh off of it. It sometimes takes it a it puts it through an extra dormancy. So if you do get them fresh, take the the fruit off, clean that, clean all the flesh off of it, and then sow them either in the garden or or in seed pots. You can get them to pop up pretty quickly if you do it real fresh. Now, the Japanese love rhodia, and they grow them in what they call koton inge culture, which is in little clay pots. So it'll just be one rosette in a little clay pot, and they pay lots and lots of money for them. And you can go to nurseries with lots and lots of them, all kinds of different variegations and sizes and leaf shapes and all kinds of things. I'm going to show some that I like for garden use. One of my very famous favorites is this Kirishima, which I have no idea what that, that name means, but it comes out almost pure white and then, well, creamy white and then becomes green. And so, and then as it ages, the, the white part stays kind of close into the base and it'll finally go all green. So it's a pretty vigorous grower, but really, really neat kind of color to it. There was something I was going to say that went through my head, but it's gone now, so it must not have been important. Another one that is always very clean and one that I can usually pick out in the garden. There's so many of them. I hesitate to ever try and put a name on one if, if whoever has it doesn't know it. This is one that I usually can, Fuji no Yuki, which means snow on Mount Fuji, basically. And this has a wide, just pure white band around the edge of each leaf. It, it's just absolutely, to me, a striking plant. Well, I know what I was gonna say before. Rhodias are a plant that, since they're evergreen, they can be tough figuring out what to do with them. What I usually do is when they're young, I don't cut back the old foliage. I give it a year or two in the ground so that there's as much photosynthesizing as possible so the plants will bulk up bigger. By about the third year, sometimes the second year, as it's coming out of spring and the new growth is starting, I'll go in and cut off the old foliage so you don't have ugly old brown fol you know, foliage that's starting to get spots and things on it. Let's see if, yeah, that has been cut back. I don't know, we'll see if I see an example of one with, with old foliage on there, but I just did that the other day in my home garden. And then when I went out to take pictures yesterday, I realized that I just had just new growth coming up. And so I had to go, go find some older pictures. Well, there you can see some, some old foliage. And this is a case where I would definitely cut off these leaves. So, so Kinsorayu, I'm not sure, Kinsorayu, I'm not exactly sure what that translates to, maybe golden dragon or something along those lines. But I might be completely off with that. Ryu, the R-Y-U generally means that when you see that on a rhodia, Ryu is, can be translated to dragon, and it usually, often in plants, it, it refers to something that's contorted or crested. So you see how it's the centers of these leaves have these raised areas on them. In rhodias, if you see that, that Ryu in the name, that will often mean that. That's like the ridge on a dragon's back is, is kind of how that's 
that's described. So this is one, the Kinsuryu is one with these kind of the streaky, creamy, yellow streaks, mostly just towards the side. Sometimes it'll come in a little bit more towards the middle, but mostly towards the side. And it's a pretty tall one. Like Fuji no Yuki will really arch over, so it does, never gets very tall, even though the leaves can get, you know, 18 inches long. This one stands upright quite a bit more, so it can get, you know, it can get almost 24 inches tall, which is pretty big for Rhodia japonica. Murei Suzumi, that means flock of sparrows. I don't know exactly what that refers to in terms of this plant, but it's kind of irregularly streaked all through it. Sometimes you get some of these ridges on there, the cresting, but not a whole lot. Often the, the leaves on this one are kind of twisted. It's, it's a nice old cultivar. It's been around for a long time in Japan. Now one that doesn't have a Japanese name that I know of, I think it arose as a seedling in Georgia at, and I, I could be wrong, but I think this is from Piccadilly Farms, Don Jacobs down in, in Georgia, Rhodia japonica, Piccadilly Pace. It's one I really like. It's got this irregular white streaking, but where you have the streaking other than, unlike, you know, these kinds, it tends to have very, Sol a lot of areas of very solid, creamy, white streaking. Kind of starts new growth like this, but then ages more to the more white uh, in there. And you can see there's some old leaves that I would cut off in there just to keep it clean. But Piccadilly Pace, it's a really good one. I, I, I've, I've loved this plant for, for a long, long time. Hmm. And then, Mark. yes. Two questions. I'm going to show my my newness to the field here. But one is, will voles eat the roots of these? Will they be a, a favorite, a feaster to these? And two, are these somehow related to the common like cast iron plants? Not very closely related to cast iron plants, no. Will voles eat them? Good question. They have kind of thick, stout rhizomes with finer roots coming off of them. I, I don't know. I've never really thought of them as being very susceptible to voles, but, but I honestly don't know. Okay, well, thank you. Yep, sorry, I couldn't answer that, that a little bit better. It's okay. <laughs> So this, this rhodia, this is a lot of times like what you get in Japan. It, it just, it won't have a name on it. So you just kind of stick something on there. So a descriptor, like heavy streak, something, something like that. But it can be, you get these big, you know, areas, broad areas. There's, there was one that I really like, Washit Akasuma, that I didn't do a picture of, but it'll have almost bands of white across it as, it as it ages. And a lot of these rhodias, when you get a young plant, it doesn't really show the color or variegation or what it's gonna do as well as it does after it's been in the ground for a, a year or two. And there's some that are just for form. This is Soryujishi, which is probably what's in the US is you could, is a a cultivar, and it's often called a ram's horn sacred lily because the, the leaves curl around, basically almost like flat on the ground and curl up. It's probably more of a type. When you, in Japan, there you'll see a lot of different forms of this with variegation and, and without and really, really tightly rolled foliage and curled. But in the U.S., it's, it's mostly the same form that you see. I don't know what that translates to either. The Ryu, you know, dragon, but this, this is, can sometimes have cresting, but not always. But there are other species. I'd always thought that there, were just, there was just the one. 
but there's actually more and, and actually some related species that have been more recently put into Rhodia. So Rhodia chinensis, I first became acquainted with this in, in Taiwan. This, this picture is the first plant of this I ever saw, and it's obviously a Rhodia when you see it, but it is about two or three times the size of even the biggest Rhodia japonica I've ever seen. The other cool thing is instead of having kind of insignificant green flowers, little spikes of insignificant, this has spikes of orange flowers, which is very cool to me. Now this is new growth coming up, so it is held right down at the base, and you kind of have to look for it to see it. But uh, the first time I saw that, I was just, I was just tickled to death by that flower, even though it's, again, not showy at all. I can hear my wife when I show her that say, why don't you grow something pretty? I think that is pretty. Rhodia pachynema is a small species. This used to be in a different genus, but it moved in, it was put into Rhodia. This has got narrower leaves with kind of a lighter streak down the middle. Once you have it growing, it's pretty easy to tell if you have Rhodia pachynema, because as far as I know, this is the only Rhodia that's stoloniferous at all. The rest of them have rhizomes, underground roots, that stay very close together. So it just, you get a clump that gets bigger and bigger. This was a single plant planted, and you can see the new ones popping up kind of farther, a little farther away. So it actually has underground rhizomes, underground stems that are, are thinner and will go farther. It was actually in the, the greenhouse, we had it in a pot and the new growth was kind of, uh, the root had come over the side of the pot and was over there. And so we immediately knew that we had pachyema. It's another one with a little orange flower, which is kind of kind of cool. Tonkinensis, this is a Vietnam form, but it's been perfectly hardy for me. Smaller plant, very like Rhodia japonica, except for the leaves tend to be smaller. It's got the kind of orange flowers, but it's got these bracts that stick out really far, which are kind of neat. And it's held on a taller stalk than most of the other Rhodias. That, that's a tall stalk right there that, you know, inch and a half, but it makes it a little bit more, more noticeable. And if you'd come in and cut off this old foliage, and so you just had the new foliage was coming up, you know, you'd really be able to see it. Especially if you've been growing it for, you know, five years and had a three foot patch of it, or eight years. Some other closely related plants are Tupistra, which I didn't put any pictures in, but this Campylandra sinensis, and you can see this is the, kind of more what the rhodia flower looks like, it's green, and it flowered for me in the middle of winter, and it's got kind of the narrower foliage like uh, rhodia pachynema with that whitish midrib. This is, again, this is a picture I took yesterday, uh, this, the flower I took a while back, but Campylandra sinensis, uh, we have this here as well, and isn't that nice with that net veined a serum right there. Mm, I do like that. Like I said, green is a color too. All right, now we're going to move into something with actual color, although I'm going to show you almost no flowers when I'm talking about begonias. A lot of these begonias I'm going to talk about are a little bit marginal. I've had a couple of very mild winters, so they've been looking really good. I mulch these well and I grow them in a protected spot. They can also grow, you can grow them in a container and move them in, indoors. Begonia palmata is a really widespread species. So where it comes from is very important for where it will grow. This is one that was collected at pretty high elevations in Arunachal Pradesh. You can see it's got the, these great lobed leaves this, you know, kind of two-tone green on the top, and it's two-tone because it's got purple on the back, which, you know, shows up through the top. Neat plant. It, it is, if it's happy, it's a pretty fast grower. It'll, it'll make a big patch. So what I tell people to do, if you get one of these 
hardy begonias, anything other than begonia grandis or begonia sinensis. Grow it as a house plant for a year or so and divide it and keep growing a part of it as a house plant and plant the other one out so that if you do lose it, you can replace it with the one that's a house plant because they're easy, great plant house plants. Another fantastic one, Coque de Castillon. This one can get pretty big. So the third year in the ground for mine, I am expecting that it will grow at least knee high and will have leaves that are approaching 12 inches across its longest dimension. Kind of a, I don't know what, what color you call this, kind of a silvery olive green on top. Um, and then this, this again, this uh, burgundy back. And you can see the flowers in there. The flowers are, are overshadowed by the foliage. So they're, they're, not, they're not the reason you grow this. Another one that's marginal. All these I'm showing are, are fairly marginal. Begonia pedatophyta. This is one that I have had out in the open garden without, without any problems. This is one we, we collected high elevation on Imeshan. The foliage is, has got this nice cut leaf. It's not burgundy on the back. There's a little bit of color in the veins, but it's mostly this nice textural foliage plant. It does flower and the flowers are actually quite big, but you can see the leaves are over it. That, that flower is kind of on the back side of this plant right here. So the leaves kind of overshadow the, the flowers, but they are, they are nice and big. And it doesn't flower terribly heavily either but it sure is happy. In just a couple of years, it's, it's about three feet across this, this begonia. And now one that's real marginal, but has survived for two winters for me is begonia Sizemore. So this is named for Mary Sizemore, who has collected a lot in this kind of subtropical Asia. Vietnam and places like that. Really neat kind of pattern to the leaf, the light green and the dark green. Uh, and then it is just so super crazy hairy. It's just covered in, in hairs. This was real late coming up for me this year. And you can see the nice pink flower. Oops, wrong direction. Nice pink flower. I have not in the past taken, taken a piece of it inside. I've just had it outside, but again, it's in a protected spot and pretty well, pretty well protected through two mild winters. So marginal, but it's worth, it's worth a spot in the garden. Just, just, you know, take a, take a leaf and, and you can do just do cuttings of it, you know, leaf cuttings uh, and it'll, it'll root from that. So easy, easy plant. Another one that we've had going since, since we collected it in 2008, Begonia chitoensis. This is, this is a Taiwan begonia. And if it's happy, like this one is, you can see how big those leaves are. And this one actually has nice flowers. They're, they're nice soft pink. I still grow it mostly for the foliage, but flowers are, are pretty nice on it. But we, we've distributed this several times and it's, it's doing quite well for, for a lot of folks. Pewterware, another real marginal one that kind of silvery, the new growth comes out kind of burgundy and then goes very, you know, silvery pewter, a little bit of reddish on the back. Great plant. Still haven't seen the flower in this and I'm not sure what it is. Uh, I will say, if you look on this backside, I don't have flowers on it, but that is the foliage of another Cypripedium, another one of the, the slipper orchids that is Cypripedium japonicum, sometimes called the Elizabethan collar orchid because it has this, these flattened leaves that just open almost flat the flower comes up in between them. That, that plant, it, no, it will, should flower next year, but don't have a flower in it yet. And then Chandler's Hardy. This, this is 
one that uh, has these very finely cut leaves that are just dotted with white that are kind of burgundy on the backside. Very cool plant. Again, protection, bring inside, uh, bring a piece inside. Now, those were three big groups of plants that I really like that I think are, are just really choice things in the, in the shade garden. Now, I'm going to just go to kind of a hodgepodge of plants. I started to do a bunch of polygonatums, but realized I had done a bunch of polygonatums before on this talk. So this is one that I just really like, polygonatum kingianum, variety kingianum. And this is a tall plant. It can get eight or more feet tall. And it'll have flowers and whorls just all the way up the stem. It is, and if you look at the tips of the leaves, see how they curl around? It wants to hang on to something. I see sometimes people put a stake in and grow it up the stake. Don't do that. Plant it near a shrub, that uh, kind of an open shrub, or big herbaceous perennial that's, that lasts all, all summer and let it kind of clamber up and just hold on with those leaf tips on its own and grow up through a plant. And it just, it, it, it likes that so much more than it does trying to stake it or, or something like that, or just having it in the garden where it flops over because it will not stand up on its own. It really needs to hang on to something. So, you know, plant it near a, a low Japanese maple, you know, or, or something along those lines. And, and it, it does, it does a great job with that. But, and that's one that when you have a good plant going, people will stop and say, what on earth is that thing? I did all herbaceous perennials, except one small group, Ardesia crenata, which are really kind of sub shrubs. They're kind of woody but they're, they're great plants. I learned it as a house plant where you grow it, you get these, these little kind of shrubby evergreen plants and then the flowers and fruit, which is the primary reason you grow these are kind of at the, you know, under the new growth. So as a house plant, it can be very nice, but out in the garden, it's great to scatter to a woodland. That's just kind of the species, but there are some really good ones. This Benny Kujaku, which is means red peacock, which new growth comes out really burgundy, comes kind of green with, with whitish pink edges and then becomes kind of greener with white edges. This is not it at its best. It, when, when it's really going good, it is really, really burgundy red foliage. It's, it, it very oddly, all the fruits will come up pretty much identical to the parent. So often what you get are seed grown plants, which, which is fine if they come out identical. There are other weird ones. These is a, this is another group that the, the Japanese do koten enge with. So they're, that mean, and when anything they do that with, there are a lot of them out there. This is uh, Shiromi daiku, daiku kuten. I'm not sure what that means, but the new growth is almost pure white. And then as it ages, it'll get green, but it doesn't just, you know, some plants kind of go from white to all green, like if this turned green, but it does it in these weird patterned ways. And then I, I believe this one has white fruit as well. A couple of unnamed ones. This, this you can see, these are, these are clay pots. This is uh, what you would see in Japan often for Koten Enge. This is another uh, white one that leaves out white, white. This is another one that comes out with white stippling. And you can see instead of having the pointed leaf, it has a rounded leaf. That's one of those things they look, like, look at in Koten Enge. And then this one has pink fruits. And there will be shows with just Ardesia crenata Koten Enge or just Rhodia japonica. Japonica Kotenenge, and, and people will bring in their prized plant and display it. We're about as, as cold as you want to do Ardesia Cronata, but I, I grow it just fine as long as you're under, you know, some high shade to give it a little bit of protection. It does, it does great. And so, you know, if I had this plant, I would sow all those seeds and just hope I'd get all kinds of weird things going. But these, these were 
these are not my plants. These are these are in Japan. I've always I've always thought about going to Japan and just getting a whole big collection of like go for just Ardesia crenata and get as many as I can or just Rhodia and, and bring them back and do coton uh, coton inge display here in the U.S. If anybody wants to underwrite my coton inge collecting trip to Japan, just let me know and uh, we'll work out the details. A few more odds and ends. I don't know if I've shown this one. This is a Juga incisa bicon, beacon. Not sure the name pronunciation, but this is quickly becoming a favorite of mine. And I will say, I'm going to talk about some podophyllums. This is not one that I have in my list. It's podophyllum call, which I'm amazed is still alive for me. But this is the leaves in the spring. So the foliage comes out, it's really, it's almost white. The older foliage behind it is, oops, is, is this. And then it has these just blue flowers. So this is a, deciduous perennial ajuga. So the bugle weed that we grow as a ground cover, this is, is kind of a, this is the relative of that. But just that plant is so striking and, you know, it's great in a, at a woodland setting. You can see I've got holly ferns and may podophyllum maples in there, hosta, there's a little aspidistra in there. So, you know, this is, this is a shady spot for sure. One I think I've talked about on this is this Titanotrichum old hamii. This is a African violet relative, grows in deep shade, bright gold flowers with red throat, really deep, deep green leaves on these kind of succulent stout stems, flowers in fall, which makes it a real, late summer going into fall, makes it a real great addition to the, the shade garden especially. And primrose, there are most, many primroses don't grow well for us. Some, some do, but one of the best is prim, prim, Primula seboldii, Seabold primrose. And there are a lot of cultivars of this. This is a cool one, drag queen with these pink flowers, very frilly leaves. And then it's got these rounded kind of fuzzy, fuzzy leaves. The other one that people always tout is growing well is Primula kisoena. I've always struggled a bit with Kisoena, but Seboldii is just rock solid and flowers early spring and then becomes kind of understated and often will disappear by, by midsummer, but then it'll pop back up the next year and it's great. And there are a bunch of selections. Salvia omiana, the woodland sage, there's some great woodland sages from, from Asia. Most of the woodland sages will have these triangular leaves like that, often with yellow flowers, not always, but often. So you'll have a rosette of foliage and then a spike of flowers. Omiena, I especially like more than I like Nipponica or Kuyame because it will usually have a dark purple back to it. So oof, really nice plant, but you plant that out in the, in the woodland. You know, and that can kind of take the place of a hosta perhaps, because those leaves can get quite large, you can see there, and they'll be green. Another kind of hosta substitute, it's not the same thing as a hosta, but this trachystemon, which sometimes is called blue needles, because it has flowers in the spring, early spring, just as leaves are coming up on these bare stems that are these little blue, almost with no petals that, that stick out. And then you get these big, just kind of coarse green leaves. It'll make a big patch, and it's you know, it kind of fulfills the same role that a hosta would in a woodland garden if, you know, deer are a real problem. Deer generally don't bother stem. There is a yellow foliaged one. I've never grown it. My guess is it's probably looks kind of sickly, but if anybody sees that around, you know, pick me up one or pick one up for yourself and give me a division. That'd be even better. Another kind of substitute for hosta, and we grow this in sun and shade, is this Symphytum Axminster Gold. Oops, let me go back. And it has these huge leaves. I've, I have some leaves that are 
24 inches long easily and probably eight inches wide chartreuse um, yellow edge around the green sem center makes this beautiful rosette it'll grow and it'll flower it'll send up a spike three or four feet tall with soft pink flowers which just seems wrong on that plant when it starts spending, sending up that spike and really flowering that rosette will start to die. It'll start to look shabby. These big old leaves will start dying. Once you get tired of that stem, the flowers have faded, it's looking kind of leggy, just cut it all the way down to the ground, cut off all the old foliage, and it'll put up new foliage and it'll look great all winter. So it's like a, having an evergreen um, hosta over the winter before it becomes this tall perennial. Now you don't want to put it in deep shade, but I keep putting it in deeper and deeper shade to see how it does. The, the flower stalk tends to flop when it gets into too much shade, but otherwise it's easy. And, and so you, you're going to cut it back kind of late spring, early summer, and then it'll, it'll re-sprout and just keeps looking better all the way through fall and into winter. Now I think we're going to end with some of the May apples and they go back and forth between Podophyllum and Dysosma, and depending on your taxonomist. Our native one is Podophyllum peltatum, and it's a, you know, a spring ephemeral for us. It comes up, pops up, looks beautiful, flowers with a, a single big white flower, and then it goes dormant early in the, the, the summer, late in the spring. The, what, how you separate according to some taxonomists, Dysosma from plant, from Podophyllum is, Podophyllum has a single flower, Dysosma has multiple flowers, is one of the ways you do it. So this is plant, though, these big tall stems with, the, the leaves are almost like green pleather, star-shaped, really fine crenations, serrations around the, the edges, and then under the flower, you get these clusters of flowers. You know, but the leaves can get quite big on it. Um, and the flower color can vary. You, you know, you got to get on your hands and knees and look, look under the, the leaves. But, you know, you can get kind of these rose. You can get really red, red. You can get dark burgundy. So there really is some, some difference to the flower color and shape a little bit. And where they sit, you see this one's like almost on the ground. Well, it is on the ground. These are up a little higher. And there is a lot of confusion in the, the genus as to what's what. And I think that's mostly because plants, original plants brought in were, were misnamed. So there's still this confusion in terms of what nurserymen are selling. So if you get Pleantha, Pleantha, oh, I still have Podophyllum, that should be Dysosma versipoli. If you get versipoli or Pleantha, you could potentially get the same plant, not because of unscrupulous nurserymen, but because of confusion in the trade. So it's good to actually see the plant and see a picture of what you're getting, but you can see the difference in the flower there, that those longer petals that are not so cup-shaped. Precipitally usually ha can have some, some coloration, but does not always. I think, like I said, there's a lot of confusion out there, which is why you need to see them in the wild and figure it out. This is one called Spotty Dotty, which is often said, people say it's versipoli Spotty Dotty. I think it's probably maybe a hybrid because of the lobing on the leaves there, which makes me think it might have some Delavei in there, but a great plant, Spotty Dotty. There, there are a bunch of them out, bunch of named ones out there some of them can be tricky to establish, but once it's established, they're easy. So you pay a lot of money for it and it dies quickly, or you pay a lot of money for it and it really goes, it takes and, and grows. So it's always hard to tell what, what's going to happen when you get it, but get in a nice uh, rich organic soil. There's a flower on there, nice red one on, on Spotty Dotty. This is Delavei. It's kind of hard to see in this just because it's almost like camouflage, but the tips of the leaves are very much lobed, which is a, a distinguishing feature of Delavei. And 
Uh, you can see the flowers there, similar flowers, but really super showy plant. Now, if you don't want to pay a lot of money and you want kind of a similar effect, that umbrella kind of look, you can get this. This was one of my kids favorite plants when they were little. They call it the fuzzy umbrellas and it comes up in the spring. I remember the first time I saw it probably 20 years ago at Plant Delights Nursery coming up and I had to go and find Tony and it's like, what is this thing? I have no idea what this is. It's in the Aster family, believe it or not, but it comes up like these little fuzzy alien mushrooms in the spring and then the leaves open up, they stay kind of fuzzy until they're, they're completely open like this. They'll lose all that fuzz eventually and just be glossy dark green. Then you'll get a flower stalk. And Tony told me the flowers are nothing. Always cut the flower stalks off. And I always did that. And then one year I didn't. And I had these flower stalks that grew up about four feet high with kind of little pink kind of powder puffs on the, the, the top. I like the flowers. I leave it in flower now. I didn't go out and get a picture of the flowers. Mine's just, just the flowers aren't quite open yet, but I like it. Now it looks like it's a clumper right here. It will, it will spread. Oops. It will spread out uh, slowly via rhizomes, but I just, I just think it's such a cool little plant. Fuzzy umbrellas, as my kids called it. And that was one every year, every spring, uh, when they were little, they liked to go out and, and see the, the fuzzy umbrellas and, and see what they were doing. So that is it. I could go on and on about shade garden plants. I love them a lot, but you know, just hitting some of the, some of the highlights after the, the orchids and uh, sacred lilies. So I'm gonna stop my share. Happy to answer questions. I see there's a lot in the yeah, chat. Question in the chat, Mark, about deer eating begonia. And I just couldn't remember if a bull got one of mine or a deer or what happened to it. Any experience with that yourself? I have had deer eat my, uh, no, not eat, my, have I had them try them. I've had them pull them straight up. I think I remember somebody saying that deer would eat wax begonias, but I never have deer eating any of my other begonias uh, in the garden. They'll eat hosta right by them, but, but not the yeah. begonias. And mine was a wax begonia, and I actually found the top right there in the garden, so I wasn't sure if it was a vole or yeah. spitting it out or what was going on. Yeah. Looks like someone's asking if any of these can take uh, water, like in a shade rain garden. It can take water. So, well, actually some of the podophyllum, some of the Asian podophyllums really prefer a moist spot, not a dry spot. So a rain garden may not work, but a, a prominently fairly wet spot would, would work. The, and calanthe as well, a lot of the calanthe, when I find them in the wild, they're in pretty, you know, I wouldn't, you know, put them in a, the edge of a pond, but they're in pretty damp areas. Somebody wrote in there, rabbits eat begonia, so there you go. <laughs> Here's a um, and Rebecca just asked, what was the last part of the name for the fuzzy umbrella? Aconite folia, so foliage like an aconite. I don't know what Lynn's question is about Jack in the pulpit. What? Uh, Lynn just said Jack in the pulpit question mark. I don't know what the question is about Jack in the pulpit. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's if you like it or not. I do like Jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit, um, a lot of those can do, yeah, I get, I get some of those in super swampy areas. I mean, I've, I've collected, not iridescence, but a different, no, maybe iridescence. I've collected erysema iridescence in, in an area where I had water come over my boots. 
the native may apple seems to like moist spots too. Yeah, little yeah. Things going through them. Lowlands. I think I got a lot of the other questions. I don't know if you wanted to add to them at all. The per it's the person who um, told me how to pronounce Bikun. Thank you. Do you know what that means? I don't know if they're still on or not. I don't, I can check. Viv also commented what the uh, other Japanese name is that you didn't know what it was. Uh, that person is still on, or at least someone is with a different than English name. <laughs> well, let's see if I can go back to Viv's comment. She said part of the name was reference to Ireland. So it was. Okay. Oh, here you go. Kira the Kirishima, if I'm pronouncing that right, which I'm sure I'm not, means Fog Mist Island. Kirishima, Fog Mist Island. Okay, that makes sense. And I do see some notes that voles love uh, rhodia. I've got fox and, and uh, owls around my house. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? <laughs> I have a bunch of feral cats that I don't think a single one of them touched them. Cats, we were, I was just talking about this earlier with somebody, cats need to be raised by a mouser in order to be good mousers. That's, you know, people have a cat and they wonder what, sometimes why they have mice. Now, now, sometimes a cat will catch a mouse, but if you want them going after voles and things like that in the garden, they have to be raised by a cat that's a mouser. That's why you get them on farms because they just kind of, the, the cats have their kittens and they keep them all around or whatever, but we have, we're breaking that instinct. So it's part instinct and part skill that they learn from their mother. They have to be carefully taught. Yeah. Golden retriever that will go after moles and voles. That sounds like that could be more damaging than the voles themselves. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> Uh, just going through the chat myself, seeing if I miss something. <coughs> oh, uh, someone did want a, a recap for the auction pickup, Mark. What's that? Someone auction wanted a recap for the auction pickup. Tomorrow, I think mostly 10 to 2, maybe. I have, I have written down 10 to 4, I think, tomorrow. Yeah, except we have so few people signed up from between 2 and oh. 4. I may, you may, I may just put my phone number out at the gate and have people call me. So but if Dennis, you can't come tomorrow, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll figure out another time. I did I ask did Dennis to send an email. What's that? I did ask Dennis to send an email out to everybody. He just sent him a text. There is, there was a question about local sources. Um, Plant the Lights is your best source for a lot of these really choice things. But I will say with Latilla, there was not a bad selection at Big Bloomers down in Sanford. I don't know if you're gonna get, I doubt you're gonna get Cypripediums and Calanthes there, but the Blatillas, they had, they probably had five or six different cultivars. I know they had Kate and Big Bob and the lavender one that starts with a Y. Yeah, they had, they had several. Have to visit. And Mary Ann oh, asked. So let me said that the Trachystemum, the deer eat. Wow, I have never had deer touch Trachystemum. Hmm. Not finding Bikun in Japanese. Oh, well. There you go. All right. What's Mary, the best Mary soil? Asked, Can I ask update. quickly? <laughs> Pardon? What's the best soil for raising these plants? Moist, well-drained, organic soil. Good, humus-rich topsoil in, in a woodland. That's, that's the best thing. Everybody, I have got another meeting I have got to get to. So I am going to have to go. But I appreciate all y'all hanging out with me on Wednesday again. Thank you, Mark. All Thank right. You. I will see you. See you all next week. See you next Wednesday. Bye. Have a great week. Thank you.